Okay, so we have now the second talk of our colloquium on cross-modal perception, Segundo Colloquio Internacional de Filosofia da Ciência, uh, organized by Grupo de Trabalho Filosofia da Neurociência da Ampof, Research Group Kiron, and Research Group Social Brains from Filosofia Unicinos. Our guest tonight is Barry Smith. Barry is a British philosopher and director of the Institute of Philosophy at the Institute of Advanced Studies of the University of London. He also co-directs the Center for the Study of the Senses and has been previously a uh, visiting professor at the University of California at Berkeley and at the Ecole Normale Supérieure and was the writer and presenter of the BBC World Service Radio series, The Mysteries of the Brain. He has also done several interviews with Philosophy Bites. Among Barry's publications we have Understanding Languages, Knowing Our Own Minds, a book that he edited with Crispin Wright and Cynthia MacDonald, Hand Handbook in Philosophy of Language, Realism and Anti-Realism, an Inquiry into Meaning Through and Objectivity, and the, he edited also Questions of Taste, the philosophy of wine. So I thank you very much, Barry, to be here with us at Unicinos today. We are very pleased to have you around us. Okay. Thank you. Sophia, so, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be back in Unicinos and speaking to your group, and I thank all of the groups that you talked about for uh, making this possible. Okay, so we're, we have a colloquium on cross-modal perception, and we need to know what that is, but we'll arrive there slowly. We'll try to find out how we get there. So if we're talking about perception, we're talking about using our senses to experience the world around us and ourselves by using our senses. But how many senses do we have? So the classic view in philosophy is that we have five. And also, many people, if you ask them, how many senses do you have, they say five. Why? Why five? We've got many more senses than five, many more. Start with proprioception. When you close your eyes, you know how to touch your nose, I hope you do. And you can do that without having to see or feel your way there. You also, right now you could close your eyes and you know where your limbs are. You know where your feet are, where your hands are, without looking at them or touching them. So that's another sense you have. Plus, you've got a sense of balance. You know if you're falling sideways, standing upright, moving forward. And that sense of balance depends on many other systems. It depends on proprioception that we've just talked about, knowing where your limbs are. It depends on vision, and it depends on the vestibular system. That's the set of ear canals you have, which contain fluid, and when the fluid moves, it tells you whether you're moving forwards or back or up or down. We can also stimulate you artificially by putting cold water into the ear while you're sitting motionless, and you will have a feeling that you're moving forward. So the vestibular system is part of the system that contributes to your sense of balance. Now, vision is important too. And we can demonstrate that, because I'm going to ask you now to do a little test. Please stand up. Okay. Now, I want you to 
stand on one leg. Pretty good. Pretty good. Now, put the leg down. Now I want you to close your eyes, keep them closed, and stand on one leg. Oh, a little more difficult. A little more difficult. Okay. All right. Please sit. So there you see that your vision is contributing to understanding how to balance yourself in your environment. And in fact, any perception you have of where the body is, what's up, what's down, is a computation that the brain does between information from the vestibular system and the visual system modulated by the initial position proprioception. Okay, so you've got, you've got this, this sense too. But we've got a way of thinking of the classical senses as being subdivided. Do we really want to say that touch is just one sense? Because you've got, certainly you've got the tactile sense, but you've also got pain, and you've got temperature, and you've even got cooling, kinesthesis, where you have stinging or cooling or burning. They can look as though they're different senses. They have a different phenomenology. They sometimes share pathways, but um, for example, the, we know the neural pathways for pain and for, for just for touch are different. If you hit your toe against something, you just have a few seconds when you know that's happened before you feel the pain. Just enough time to go, ah. <laughs> And, and you, feel, you feel the sensation, then you feel the pain. Also, because, you, you, can, you, because there, you can gate the pain pathways by rubbing the area that's been injured. If you rub it, the brain will give more attention to the, to the feeling of sensation than it will to pain, and that will allow you to, to, to lower the threshold for pain. Okay, so we've got touch, Tactile sensations, temperature, pain, cooling, all of these. Many, many things we can think of as part of touch. And we might think that many of the senses, instead of treating them as one, can be broken down into others. And we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. But as well as having the external senses, touch, taste, sight, smell, uh, hearing, we also have internal senses. We have interoception. We have the feelings in the body. And the feelings in the body can be a change in your heart rate, a feeling of excitement in the stomach. It might be the tensing of the muscles in the musculoskeletal structure. And you have an awareness or sensors that could give you an awareness of these things. You, you've got internal senses. So we might think that there's the exteroceptive body, which allows you to have perception of the environment, sense of agency that we were talking about earlier in the previous talk, and a feeling of embodied cognition. But there's also sensations from within, and that will give you a lot of information about emotion and self-regulation. So, your senses are not just to perceive the world around you, but also to perceive yourself and to understand the emotional state of the self. So let's do another little experiment. How many senses are engaged when we're tasting or, or drinking? When I had that delicious green juice a few moments ago, how many senses was I using when I was drinking this? Well, it depends what you're eating or drinking. So, Here's a question I often ask people. How many senses does it take to taste champagne? Well, any thoughts? How many? Any numbers? Three, two, four, four. Any advance on four? Okay. I, th I, I think maybe six. I think maybe six, but we'll, we'll get there. So. You could be looking at the champagne, you could see the color, you can see if it's a rosé or it's, uh, it's not. We also know the noise of the champagne cork. 
But as well as that noise, there's the noise that the bubbles make inside the mouth. When you hear the rush of the moose across the tongue, you can hear it internally in your head. And then there's this lovely quote by a sensory scientist, Harry Lawless. I often think I can tell something about the quality of a fine champagne by listening to the fizz. Many small bubbles give off a higher pitched fizz than the gross, clumpy, fat bubbles of a club soda. So let's go back and see whether we can tell the difference between club soda and champagne and Prosecco. So I'm going to play you the sound of these three different liquids, Prosecco, Champagne, Club Soda, being poured from the same size bottle at the same rate into the same shape of glass. And first of all, just tell me if you can hear the difference, and then I'll ask you a question about them. Okay, so we're trying to figure which is which. All right, let's go. First sound. Let me play that again because I didn't have the sound well enough. Okay, first sound. Okay, second one. Third one. Okay, which was the club soda? First one, first one, first one, absolutely. And the champagne? Three, exactly. So some of you are absolutely on the money. Let me, let me play them again for you. So, oops, let me play them again so that you can hear the difference. So here's the club soda. Here's the Prosecco. And here's the champagne. Okay, quite different. Now what's interesting is you didn't know that you had that knowledge, right? You didn't know that your brain had paid attention already to whether you were listening to something with fat bubbles or something with very fine bubbles, but you can tell the difference just by hearing between club soda and uh, these other flavors. I'm going to do the same now just to give you, for those of you who are not used to drinking those differences, I'm going to tell, tell you this is a liquid, these are liquids being poured into a cup, glass cup, and it's either hot or cold, and I'll play you both and you tell me which is hot, which is cold. Okay, you ready? And here's the second one. Okay, so let me play the first one again. Hot or cold? Cold, yes, of course. And <laughs> And, and what's really interesting, again, you didn't know that your brain had been doing that work, that you could tell just by your ears, is that hot or cold? But notice how to learn that, it had to be a multi-sensory experience. You had to be seeing or feeling a glass that was cold, tasting it, and hearing the pouring, seeing the pouring, tasting, feeling, and knowing cold, okay? So that's what's going to tell you that uh, you have actually got this information. Now, of course, people in advertising and marketing, they can take advantage of this because they can say, ah, if you can tell the difference between hot and cold, then we'll make something uber cold. We'll make a sound that isn't in nature. We'll just accentuate those noises. So here's beyond cold for advertising. <laughs> oh, give me the juice, yes. So, so this, is, this is a sign that um, we have got that information. We didn't know we had the information. All right. So um, back, to, back to the senses. So there's also temperature. Temperature matters. I did some work with uh, Mum Champagne, a champagne house, 
and they had their special cuvee bottle, uh, Ar Lalu, 1979, and they created a dinner where they served the same wine at five different temperatures for different parts of the meal. So when they were eating seafood, it was icy cold. This was very sharp, rather sour. And then, then you warm it up a bit. And by the time it was almost room temperature warm, so the bubbles are very d diffuse, it, it was almost sweet. You could eat this with dessert. So temperature makes a difference to how things taste too. All right, but with champagne, we've talked about um, sight, sound, touch, the feel of the bubbles in the mouth, taste, of course, smell, we'll come back to that. But there's an, another sense involved, uh, the trigeminal nerve, and I'll talk about that later. But as well as having many senses, many more senses than five, we're also learning that the senses interact, and that's the topic of this colloquium. How do the senses interact with each other? How do they affect each other's workings? Now, we didn't know that the senses interacted so much with one another, not just because experience doesn't teach us that, but because textbooks used to go in for very clear separations. You would have these maps, you know, here's the somatosensory area, here's the motor area, here's the insula, which is the taste cortex, here's the piriform cortex for smell, here's the occipital for vision and so on. And it was as if they were quite separate, but we now know that the senses talk to one another and they interact with each other and they interact in at least two different ways that I'm commenting on. And it was because of this that in London we started a center for the study of the senses where we work with psychologists and neuroscientists together and philosophers. We want to know how many senses do we use to experience the world? How do the senses interact to shape our experience? And how sensitive are we or how sensitive can we be to the interactions between the senses? Now this bears on classic philosophical discussions. First of all, is consciousness unified? When you see and hear and feel and taste, do they occur in separate parts of conscious experience? Or do they all come together into one conscious experience, one unified conscious experience? While you're listening to my voice and seeing my slides, are you having a single unified experience or do you have an experience of hearing and an experience of seeing, and are they different? Is consciousness multi-sensory? Are there many senses that create the experience you have now? And our perceptual experiences themselves, when we perceive something, is that experience multi-sensory, or is it always unisensory? When I perceive something, do I perceive by seeing it? Do I perceive by hearing it? Do I perceive by touching it? Does that mean these are, perception is always a visual perception, an auditory perception? Or can there be perceptions that are both audiovisual or many, many more senses? And how could we find out? How could we tell? Well, you might say, we should be able to tell whether our experience is multi-sensory or unisensory because we know our experience really well. That's one of the, the things that we're most aware of. We're just aware of our experience. But how well, how well do we really know? How well can we really know our perceptual experience? So philosophers have often characterized experience as a domain where there's no appearance reality distinction. They say, in experience, how things appear is how they are. I don't know whether my experience is an accurate representation of what's outside, but at least I know how the experience is. I know how I'm experiencing things. It seems to me as if I'm sitting in a room full of people with lights shining on me speaking. Surely I can't be wrong about that. I know that. I just don't know whether it's accurate. That's, that's a very traditional philosophical move. But how do things appear to us in consciousness? 
and what goes into appearing them appearing in a certain way and is how things appear at any moment an accurate guide to how they are really in experience can we be mistaken about our own experience I think we can so I think when Descartes said I'm going to doubt everything I'm going to put everything I have previously believed out of mind I'm going to submit myself to, the, to doubt I'm not going to take anything except what I'm certain of he just didn't go far enough because he thought he could be certain of how he experienced things he wasn't certain that his experiences were accurate veridical but he thought he could know the contents of his own mind transparently in the Cartesian mind there are no shadows there are no tricks of the light there are no dark places where things are hiding everything is as it appears and that that image of the fully transparent inner mind is still very powerful we still feel the appeal of it we were tempted to that view all the time <clears throat> so when we try to get at our experiences when we try to discover our own experiences there might be two questions we could ask did we experience something at a given moment now lots and lots of psychology experiments are done where stimuli are presented at such a short interval you know less than 250 milliseconds less than 100 milliseconds that you might wonder did I see something was there something on the screen now we know that presenting stimuli at 150 milliseconds can have a priming effect that something that you subsequently perceive or judge can be affected by something that was there so briefly and we also know that people may not be able to report having seen something but the question as Dan Dennett once asked was there something in consciousness but so briefly that it was airbrushed out that you don't remember or you don't hold on to it was there something that appeared in consciousness when you get around threshold uh, levels for judgment it's very difficult to know people often say I think I saw something but I'm not sure or they're confident there was something but they can't tell you what it was okay so that's question one but I'm interested in question two when it is clear that something happened in consciousness when it is clear that we were undergoing a perceptual experience what can we know about what we experience what can we actually tell well there's a lot of talk of it's it's straightforward there's just what it's like to experience something at any moment and philosophers now are all the time ready to use this treacherous locution what it's like to taste a strawberry or to smell a rose or what it's like to see a sunset or what it's like to hear middle C played on a piano and they imagine that that expression what it's like beautifully captures and picks out for scrutiny some perfectly formed experience the beginning and ends of which we don't have to worry about it's just there fully in view and you can now take that as the topic of philosophical inquiry what it's like to smell a rose and what it's like is not meant to be a reference fixing description as we say technically it's not meant to be here's a way of just picking out something whose real nature we'll find out about later it's supposed to be it captures everything there's no there's no underlying nature that might be misleading what it's like is just the phenomenology it's just all there but what does it bring into view I think this what it's like story or locution is very misleading there was something it was like but there's a difference between being in a mental state and knowing what mental state you are in big difference so you might you might be in a mental state no doubt you were in a mental state but but what was the nature of that state sometimes I might feel am I excited am I nervous I can't quite tell the difference you might put your hand on something and say is it very very cold or very very hot I'm not sure for a moment so it's not obvious that just being in a state will announce to you 
what kind of state it is. You, you have to do some work to find out. Okay. Now, let's look at what goes on in, in a typical experience. I say, suppose you were in the Descartes position. I don't know if the world is accurately presented to me, but this is how I'm experiencing it. Well, we might say, we seem to see, I seem to see an object in front of me. Or I seem to see a familiar face. Or I seem to hear the sound of a taxi. We seem to taste the saltiness of the bacalao. Wow. <laughs> okay, these are all things. And, and what I want you to concentrate on is that, that the seeming isn't just about the content. The seeming is also about the way we experience it. I seem to see it. I seem to hear it. I seem to taste it. Okay? The seeming also is about the way the object was given to me, a seeing or a hearing or a touching or a tasting. Now, can we associate every perception with one of these ways things are? Well, look, I seem to see a familiar face, but is seeing a familiar face just a visual experience? Probably not, right? It's not as though the familiarity is in the face. And the familiarity isn't something that's just a particular shape. The familiarity has to be some way in which at that moment, what's visually presented to me has been influenced by things I have visually seen before and encoded and, and, and ordered. So how much, how much is packed into one of these experiences? It's not, it's not always clear. And can every experience that you have be associated with a particular sense modality, seeing or hearing or touching or tasting? That's often an assumption that philosophers will make that you can associate each of these experiences with a particular sensory modality. But, but is that right? So I'm going to ask, how do, we, how do we give our experiences a modal signature? How do we know what sensory modality they are occurring in? How do we know it's a seeing? How do we know it's a hearing? How do we know it's a touching or a tasting? Well, philosophers might make claims about this that are not the same as ordinary people's claims. For example, people will say, if I'm seeing Sophia, it's a different experience than if I'm seeing Maria, Sophia's twin sister. Visually, things could look exactly alike. My visual system could be affected in roughly the same way maybe exactly the same way. But philosophers might say, it's a different experience. It's a different experience seeing Sophia and seeing Maria. Because they might say that it's the relation between the object and what's going on from the retina in the brain. The whole thing is the seeing, okay? So there's, there's a, it's not as though we know how to precisely decide what's in a seeing. You might have a philosophical view that it involves the object. You might have an internalist view that it's just about what's happening in the phenomenology. We don't, we don't know. There's, there's, but, but the main thing is, whatever experiencing you're having, it's one thing to have an experience, and it's another thing to classify that experience, to taxonomize your experience as the kind of experience it is. That's an extra move. And that's where you could go wrong. That's where you can make mistakes. <clears throat> so, what are experiences experiences of, and how are they experienced? What's the, the, the sensory modality you're using? Well, you might think it's just what, what's causing the experience. Is it just that it's caused by uh, uh, light hitting the retina, or, or um, uh, sound waves hitting the inner ear? Is it just the cause? That's not going to help because we're at any moment being bombarded by many causes. Many, many things are impinging on our receptors, on our sensory equipment. 
So exactly which ones are responsible for having the experience that I call a seeing or a hearing? That's not yet decided. We need to figure that out. Okay. So let's go back to this idea. Philosophers ask what it's like to smell a rose, and they think that just by saying there is something it's like, <clears throat> that they've isolated a paradigm of olfactory experience. But is there such a thing as pure smelling without any other experience going on? Can you, can you have an experience of smelling where you're not experiencing standing upright or even lying down, where you're not experiencing your own body, where you're not experiencing any sound from the environment? Can you really have something where the only thing in consciousness is just olfaction? I think it's very unlikely that you ever have that. So it's more likely that what's happening is you're only attending to the olfactory part of that experience rather than saying that's all that's happening, that's what you're attending to. And of course, attention to something means you're taking your attention away from something else. So it's probably the case that you think you're having none of those other experiences but they can still be there. They can still be having an impact on the totality of consciousness at that moment. Okay. <clears throat> now, we are interested in whether your experiences are not single modality, but whether they involve many modalities. And I want to suggest there's a difference between whether our experiences are multisensory integrations where there are a fusion of different senses and cases where one sense affects the working of another. So, cross-modal interactions are where the presentation, this is from Charles Spence and Tim Bain, where the presentation of a stimulus in one sensory modality influences the perception or performance of an individual responding to a stimulus in a different modality. It's where how things sound might affect how they look, or how things look might affect how they smell, or how things smell might affect how they feel, okay? Multisensory integration can refer to either the neural integration of signals from different sensory modalities combined, or at the level of experience, information from two or more sensory inputs being fused into a single unified perception. Now, I'm going to now give you examples of each of these so you can see the difference. So, are we talking about the fusing of the senses or just that they affect each other and they're combined? Okay, so let's look at cross-modal effects. So here's a familiar cross-modal effect. When you're in the cinema, you think you hear the voices coming from the actors' mouths. But they can't be coming from the actors' mouths. That's a screen. The only thing they can be is sounds coming from the side of the movie theater, from behind you, from in front of you, or from under the seat, but not from the screen. So what's happening is that because you're hearing sounds that are in sync, synchronized with mouth movements. Your vision is dominating your audition and it's relocating the perceived look source of the, of the sound to where the mouths are. So this is visual capture of auditory attention, okay. But you still know you're seeing and hearing something. You still have both senses, but you didn't know that what you're hearing depends so much on what you're seeing. And of course, there's a, uh, an effect called the McGurk effect, uh, which I should have made a slide of, but it's difficult to embed. So then the McGurk effect, people see a mouth making this movement. And it's the movement you would make for the sound ga. But at the same time, you are being played through the auditory channel, the sound ba, ba, ba. So you see the mouth movement for ga, and you hear 
ba. But what you hear when they're presented together, you hear something in between. You hear da. Not ga, not ba, da. Something exactly in between ga and ba phonetically. That's something you neither saw nor heard. So that experience is a composite. It's made from the brain's sight and sound combining. And that's a case of multisensory integration, I think, rather than just multi than cross modal effects, I think. Although you do notice that you're looking and you're seeing, but you pay almost no attention to thinking that you're looking at the mouth. Here's another cross modal effect that we worked on aircraft noise. The sound of an aircraft cabin, 79 decibels or above has an impact on the tongue's ability to perceive salt, sweet, and sour, can reduce it by about 10 or 15%. Who knew? So you've got that terrible drone of the engines, and it's having an effect on how you perceive food. You still know that it's the taste you're experiencing. It's not a fusion of taste and sound. Sound is having an impact on how you taste things, right? But that's a cross-modal effect. It's not a, it's not a fusion of the two. Another example is where if you give people liquids that are sweet and they rank them, this is sweeter than this, is sweeter than this, sweeter than this, and then you give them the liquid with the aroma of vanilla, they will perceive the liquid as sweeter. And not only that, if you give somebody just sub-threshold vanilla, so they don't smell it, they think it's just air, just below their threshold, and you give them sucrose solution just below sweetness, they think it's just water. When you give them together, they perceive sweetness and they smell vanilla aroma. So there's a super additive effect of combining, but this is a cross-modal effect. They still know there's a smell and a taste here. So let's look at that versus multisensory integration, where what we think is happening is that the signals are actually being combined in certain multisensory interaction sites. The orbital frontal cortex is an interaction site, so is the uh, SDS, uh, superior temporal sulcus, also. Okay, now, here's a case. Uh, when you're eating Pringles, and you leave them out of the box for a day or for two days, they're not very nice. They don't taste fresh. But if you put headphones on and you amplify the, the sound of your own crunching, they taste fresh. This is very reliable. This is work by Charles Spence and his colleague Zampini. Uh, and this was a uh, this, this was a big surprise. But this looks as though you're getting something which you just think of as the taste of fresh, the taste of fresh crisps. And you don't realize that it's made from sound and from uh, touch. Touch and sound are making that taste. They get fused together. Another one is if you give people sucrose solutions, a little bit of sugar and water for each of those bottles, they cannot help telling you that the red one tastes sweeter than the green one, and the green one tastes more sour than the red one, even though they're exactly the same. So here, color vision is having an impact, and you get something which is created jointly by color and by vision. It's not just that you, you, you see both and you think, okay, I, I, I can experience them separately. You can't experience the taste separately from the color here. But here's perhaps the most convincing case of multisensory integration. And it's, it's the case where uh, vision is dominated by the vestibular system, by the ear canals. Some of you heard this on Monday, I apologize, but we'll do it again. So the next time you're on an airplane and you, you get on, you sit down, you strap yourself in, and the crew are telling you there are two doors at the rear and two of the wings and two at the back and so on. Look around the cabin, see where everything is, okay? And it all looks as though it's at eye level in front of you. Now look again when the plane is climbing 
and it will look to you as though the front of the plane is higher than you are. But how can it look that way? Because you're in exactly the same optical relation. Your eyes are in exactly the same optical relation to everything in the cabin, whether you're flat or at an angle. So it's the ear canals, it's the vestibular system, because it tells you you're tilting backwards, is changing how things look. So here, this is a multi-sensory integration. It's an experience you can't have by either modality alone. You can only have it because it's a product of both. But you think of it as a unisensory experience. You mistakenly think of it because it's a unified experience. And you think it's a unified experience. I'm using my eyes. It must be vision. But it's not. It's not vision alone. Flavor. When you're eating food, this is multisensory integration par excellence. When you eat food, the brain has to put together information from touch, taste, smell, temperature, the trigeminal nerve. It has to put all of this together, and yet it gives you a single experience. And you tend to think that single experience is taste. It's the taste. Because you're used to thinking every perception you have with its characteristic feel must be one modality. So you think, taste. But what is tasting? Well, very little of it is coming from the tongue. All you get from the tongue are these basic tastes, salt, sweet, sour, bitter, umami, metallic. We think you have receptors for the metallic taste. If you cut your finger and there's blood, you, suck, you can taste the iron in your blood. Fat, the jury's out. Maybe we have fat receptors in the tongue. We don't know. But that's, look, that's all you've got. Salt, sweet, sour, bitter, savory. But you can taste mango, pineapple, melon, strawberry, blueberry, uh, raspberry, okay, cherries. You don't have cherry receptors on your tongue. That's coming from the nose. That's all coming from the nose. And if the nose is not involved, you can't get any of those fruit flavors, okay? So that's surprising because that means that smell goes unrecognized when you're tasting. You don't realize how much. People say maybe up to 80% of what we call taste is in fact coming from smell. And we know that because when people lose their sense of smell, they go to their doctor and they say, I can't taste anything. And a good doctor says, well, put out your tongue, put some salt, put some lemon juice, put some sugar. Can you taste that? Yes, but that's all I can taste. And now they know everything else is due to the nose, is due to smell. Okay. But why does smell go unrecognized? Well, we think it's because what you're smelling is actually, although it's a sensation of smell, olfaction, it's getting interpreted as if it were a sensation on the tongue. And the brain is referring that sensation. Remember we talked about in ventriloquism in the cinema, you think the sounds are coming from the screen. Here the brain thinks that experience from smell is actually coming from the tongue. It's not coming from the tongue. But the sense of smell comes from one of these two roots. So you've got two ways smell approaches the very same receptors up here in the olfactory epithelium. Either by breathing in, you take odors from the environment into the nose, or when you have odors in the mouth, they pass to the nose from the mouth. And in fact, when you swallow, you pulse odors up to the nose. That's why you get a big hit when you swallow. Now you know how something tastes. But a lot of people think a lot of neuroscientists, I'm afraid, think that that second sense of smell or that second root, retronasal olfaction, they think we're unconscious of that. That's why we don't know about it, because we're unconscious. But we can't be unconscious of it because we still get everything it produces in flavor. We get those fruity flavors from smell. It's not as though they're unconscious. It's not as though we just get all of our food is salty or bitter or sweet or sour and that's it. No, no, not unconscious. But we definitely confuse something that's a smell with a taste. 
So when you smell vanilla, it smells sweet, dulce, but actually if I give you a little bit of vanilla, it's not sweet, there's no sweetness. It tastes quite amargo, it's, got, it's bitter. And also notice if you smell something like a cherry or a strawberry or a peach, and you say it smells sweet, sweet's a taste, it's not a smell. And sweet things, sugar, sucrose, has no smell. So what's happening is that it's because we're combining taste and smell together that the brain is thinking it's just taste. And when we have vanilla ice cream, that's a way in which we take the taste of sugar and the smell of vanilla, and because we combine them, we think the vanilla flavor and the vanilla smell is sweet, but the vanilla is not sweet. That's a trick of the brain. So information from these two sources gets combined in the orbital frontal cortex, okay? This little area just behind the head here. That's where sensory inputs from the insula and from the piriform cortex get put together, and that's where we experience uh, flavor. Now, as well as having touch and smell, sorry, taste and smell, we've also got the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve is the one that serves the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, and it's the one that, that goes crazy if you have too much spice. If you have too much wasabi, ah, you feel it here, right? The bridge of the nose. It's also what's reacting to those bubbles in champagne. When you have the CO2 bubbles in champagne, the fizzy bubbles, that's, CO2 is a pure trigeminal stimulant and it's having an effect on your perception of champagne. It suppresses sweetness and accentuates sourness, just as it does in Coca-Cola. It's exactly what it does in Coca-Cola. Okay. So, is flavor just, uh, that should be non-conscious taste and smell? It's the, fusion, it's the fusion of taste and smell, not just that they're co-occurring, not just that you're having a taste and a smell, and maybe some trigeminal stimulation. It's because they're fused into a single percept that you're getting multisensory integration. So what we call taste is an amalgam of taste, touch, and smell. And the experience that produces tasting is multimodal, combines inputs from different sense modalities into a single unified experience of flavor. It's not just a cross-modal effect. It's not just the co-occurrence of different modalities they're integrated and experience as though they're a single modality. Now that leaves some people like Charles Spence and uh, the philosopher Tim Bain to say, is there a distinct sense with which flavor experiences might be associated or are flavor experiences multisensory? So Spence and Bain are prepared to consider the possibility that because flavor is so unified that we have another sense, as well as the five senses, as well as balance, as well as proprioception. We've also got a flavor sense that gives you complete flavor experiences. Okay, that's, they're prepared to think about that. But multisensory integration seems to be not just going on in flavor or in aircraft. It seems as though it might be the rule and not the exception. This is happening all the time. So, is our conscious experience multisensory, and does it, do most of our experiences have this multisensory character? Well, in order to determine whether consciousness is unisensory or multisensory, we need to have some way of associating experiences with particular sensory modalities. And that's what we've seen to be problematic. If we're going to say, is it multisensory or unisensory, you've got to have decided what counts as a smelling or a seeing and what counts as a hearing. But when we look at cases, we seem to see many cases where we're involving other senses in even the existence of what we're calling a taste or what we're calling a smell. So it's not, it's not obvious that we can do this. And it's very problematic with the chemical senses in flavor. Okay. So here's, here's a concession on flavor experiences as multisensory. Um, if there are sense modalities that require no input 
and no cross-modal influence from other modalities. If there is ever such a thing as a purely unisensory experience, a pure hearing, a pure touching with nothing else, then they're very remote. They're very remote from conscious perceptual experience. And they're not the sort of things that can be thought of as the senses that we rely on in perceptual experience. On the other hand, our ordinary way of thinking about the senses has been shown to be at best confused and at worst inadequate when it comes to characterizing experiences that result from acts of tasting. This is a paper by Charles Bence and Malika Overy and myself. So, how multisensory is perception in general? Can multiple modalities be simultaneously present in consciousness? And that's the question of whether neurologically normal adult humans can enjoy experiences associated with more than one of these modalities at one time. Can they have these modalities in mind at one time? Multisensory, uh, uh, the view or the, or the unisensory view. And here's the funny thing. Having been a champion of multisensory integration, Charles Spence is of the view, along with Tim Bain here, that all conscious experience is unisensory that you can't have a conscious perceptual experience in many senses. It only has to occur in one sense. He thinks below the level of consciousness, at the level of processing, there's multisensory integration, there's a lot of interaction. But in conscious experience, it's one sense at a time. You never have experiences with more than one sense. That's a very strange view. So what's the, what's the argument for that? Well, the argument is, that it's very difficult experimentally to align vision, audition, proprioception, in perception in order to make synchronicity judgments. Can you judge, can you judge whether you heard and saw something at the same time or you felt and heard something at the same time? Can you do that? And Spence and others have looked at this experimentally and found people are really bad at it. When you get down into the sub 100 millisecond range, people's judgments are not good about when things happened at the same time. They're not good at that. And so they think, given that people are poor at it, he thinks the reason why they're poor at judging simultaneity is because they're not actually happening simultaneously in consciousness. Subjects are unable to judge whether certain of their experience are simultaneous or successive. So these are illusions of consciousness for Spence and Bain, the idea of simultaneity, the idea that we're hearing and seeing something at the same time. These are illusions. Here they are trying to set out their view. Perhaps we mistake our ability to effortlessly and immediately bring either tactile or auditory stimuli into consciousness for the fact that both stimuli, both stimuli of both kinds are in fact simultaneously co-conscious. The effortless access that one has to features of the world may give rise to an introspective illusion that one is simultaneously aware in more than one modality at once. But, according to the proposal under consideration, this would be but another manifestation of the observation that we can be very wrong about certain aspects of our own experience. So they're already signed up for the view that they doubt the accuracy we have in making judgments about our own experience. So why does it seem to us? Why does it seem, remember, is seeming how things are or is seeming getting things wrong? Is there, a, is there an appearance reality distinction in experience or about experience? And Bain and Spence think there is. Why does it seem as if we can experience simultaneous audio, audio, visual, and tactile stimuli? They think it's because we switch our attention very fast between the modalities. You're now listening, you're now looking. You're consciously feeling, you're consciously looking. You're switching your attention between them very fast. A subject's awareness of the world involves frequent and rapid alternations or switches between different modalities or channels. That's their view. The switching of attention isn't under conscious control. 
and it's imperceptible in the time frame. It happens so quickly that you can't tell that you've switched from hearing to seeing and back to hearing, according to them. But that's odd because if you can't tell in consciousness, then these unisensory experiences that you move between are happening in a time scale too small for consciousness to register them. It would be like a priming experiment. And yet we have this phenomenology of a smooth coming together of both. So these intermodal switches and the duration of any sense-specific unisensory segment is not specified and is empirically very hard to determine, very hard. So why should we believe this? Subjects don't even have a meta-level or a metacognitive awareness of the structure of their conscious experience. They don't know. Similarly, the holders of the view that the multisensory structure of consciousness, they, didn't, they don't have to suppose that, that we are able to recognize that our experiences are multisensory. So now you've got the competition between two views. One view, our experience is multisensory, but we don't always recognize it is. And the other view is our, our experience is always unisensory, but we're switching very fast and we don't recognize that we are. Both views are suggesting we're wrong about our experience, okay? And now it's a question of which one is the more sensible view? So on either of these accounts, subjects don't have transparent access to the, con to the, to the contents of their own experience. They don't know their own experiences properly. And Spence and Bain's conclusion is somewhat ironic because to save the unisensory hypothesis, and remember, they started out with the unisensory hypothesis that every perceiving is in a modality of seeing or hearing to save common sense. That was the idea that along came neuroscientists and psychologists and said we have multisensory perception, multisensory integration. And they wanted to say, no, 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 we have unisensory. We, we, we see or we hear, and now they're having to come up with a view which is so counterintuitive and contradicts common sense and doesn't even allow people to have any insight into something they're miraculously doing, switching attention between two experiences that are happening so quickly that you can't hold on to either of them, but somehow they both seem to be present at once. And it's more ironic for Tim Bain because he believes in the unity of consciousness and now the unity of consciousness doesn't depend on co-consciousness, the having in a single conscious sphere, hearing and seeing. It depends on a little unity of hearing and then a little unity of seeing and a switching between them. And this flickering is milliseconds, hard to measure. And also we're blind to the change in our experience when moving from one to the other. This is a very, very puzzling view to hold, I would say. So do we need to take this option? And does the empirical evidence require it? No. So we are sensitive, although we are not good at making judgments about synchronicity, we're not good at telling when we were tapped on the nose and heard a sound at the same time, or we saw a light flash and heard a sound at the same time. We are sensitive to interruptions of synchronicity. When synchronicity breaks down, when synchronicity is broken, it bothers us. And we know that from film. Go back to ventriloquism. When there's a soundtrack and a visual, when they get out of sync, you're disturbed. You break the illusion. You no longer think the sounds are coming from the mouths of the actors. Now, if you leave it for another two or three minutes, the brain will eventually put those back together again, even though there's a delay. But we are sensitive to interruptions to synchronicity, which suggests we're able to keep track of it. Also, I suggest, contrary to Spence and Bain, that we can align vision, audition, and proprioception in an experience that requires us to have very precise timing, and that's in dancing. Dancing is a really good case. Dance requires us to integrate information from sound 
and to anticipate the movement and the mechanical feedback from the limbs in order to plan a movement that's going to happen just at the time when the music reaches a particular place. That's an incredible act of synchronicity. And we know who's got it, and we know who hasn't. You just have to look at people at a Barry Manilow concert, and they're clapping out of time with the music. So we know that it's, it's, it's a real feat. You hear some sounds, it's slow. The body is slow to send those motor signals. And it's got to send them knowing what will happen when the music reaches just that point. It's an incredible act of synchronicity that we're doing. And this requires skilled judgment of synchronicity based on predictive processing. So now that we know that, that a lot of our perception and action is based on prediction of what's going to happen, it's much easier to say, we're not good at judging simultaneity, but we're very good at judging when to predict things will happen together. And we can do that. And Friston and others have talked about achieving those sensitivities by getting prediction errors, you realize you're out of time with the music and you've got to adjust until you get precision, until you get the prediction just right. Okay. So, the nature of conscious experience. The nature of conscious experience needn't be as it seems to us or as it strikes us. It can be multi-sensory, but to claim that we're wrong about our own experience isn't to go with Dennett and other people who say, it's all an illusion. There's less going on than we think. No, we can still have very rich, very detailed experiences. And the rich temporal structure of experience, its layers and its multisensory character can be brought to light by harnessing the combined approaches of the phenomenology, looking at the brain and body, looking at neurophysiology and sensory and other behavioral testing. We need all of that information. So conclusions to be drawn about the nature of experience need to be sensitive to the results of a massive interdisciplinary approach to conscious experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. Uh, so, now we have uh, some time for questions and con uh, uh, chat with Barry. There's somebody up there. I <laughs> there guess. is Gabriel yes. already. And okay. Um, first of all, um, many thanks for your very clear uh, presentation. Uh, for me, it was a special pleasure because I think the question of a census uh, is, is being conducted in a misleading way since Plato. And what, what you're doing, uh, it's revolutionary in a very important sense. We, uh, um, instead of working with what I used to call uh, recapped, like, like a recap tire ontology, you're trying to, to build up something uh, new from the beginning, and, and that's very important. Sometimes we get, have to get rid of the history of philosophy yeah. and try to, to really produce a new ontology in the sense of construing new, th new theses on how about the world is, is, is organized. So th that's a general comment that I, was, I think was a very powerful talk, and I, I really appreciate your work. Uh, but I have two or three technical questions. Um, first, I completely agree that Tim Bain's hypothesis is, is, is uh, stillborn. I think it makes no sense at all. Uh, actually, I had some discussions with him in the Association for Scientific Study of Consciousness. They always give this picture. I'm seeing the, the barman doing acrobatic cocktailing, and I'm hearing the mambo, and I'm drinking my mojito. But I'm just switching saccades. Yeah. That, that, that doesn't make sense at all. You, you, you have a whole picture yeah. of the bar, the, your drink, yeah. and uh, all the perspective, perspective uh, pleasure from these different modalities integrated somehow. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of uh, empirical evidence in, the fa in favor of a, a more sensible position. For example, integrate. Uh, uh, window, time window of 
uh, sound integration. It, it seems a very solid hypothesis that's being tested. And we see different capacities between musicians and lay people. Yeah. If you compare them, lay yeah. musicians, trained musicians, have l uh, uh, um, a spread of time to integrate like more, I would say, liberal thresholds in terms of, yeah. of timing. That, yeah. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. And it, it seems that the brain can be trained. Yeah. The same thing about sommeliers and wine. Yeah. Uh, the power of a, so I think your position is much more sensible in this sense as well. But, but the two uh, technical questions I would like to see your thoughts about will be, you use exactly this sentence. You said something is to have this experience and something is taxonomizing this experience. Yes. I, I completely agree, cognition or metacognition or experience and metacognition. But you have something in between. You have these auto, almost automatic valences that contribute to experience. For example, sugar is, is, is a case when the contribution of automatic valence is very severe. Yeah. Uh, we, because of uh, evolutionary um, questions, uh, the prospective pleasure of sugar is very big compared to other uh, tastes, for example. So we have automatic valences. If you, if you are uh, hungry, uh, more caloric food, as people that you even cite in, in your works, like Kringle Bar Lab, and it's already shown that you, your perspective feeling of uh, pleasure uh, changes the organoleptic properties of yeah. this food. Yeah. So I'd I'll, I'll like to see some comments on this level that is in between the experience, uh, the, the most, I'll say, automatic biting and the uh, this valences, some, sometimes just uh, thalamic valences or even more sophisticated valences as emotional valences in the perception of food. Uh, the uh, the Proust uh, example is always cited in, in these cases as well. Uh, so I, I can see various different levels of influences of automatic, more and less automatic valences they are not yet taxonomizing the experience, but it's something there is not the basic experience you described in the first part of a talk. That's the, the first question. And the second question is, when you have to, there's the idea of ecological validity, they actually prefer to call ecological relevance. Sometimes it's very, very hard to mimic a, a real life situation in a lab. But we're working, when you're working on cross-model uh, cross perception, it, it's easier to isolate, to have separable uh, and, and combinable uh, variables in the lab. So I think there's a lot of work that, that can be done in the next years to separate and reintegrate the normal experience that we have, that we obviously, as you defend, is cross-model. Thank you. So, so the talk of valence is really interesting because um, you, you might wonder whether given that the brain is trying to put so much information together, why doesn't it put the, uh, the information about valence together as well? Why, do, why doesn't the hedonic element become part of flavor perception? And I think it doesn't, I mean, a lot of people intuitively think it does. I mean, children, when children don't like broccoli, they think the disgustingness is in the broccoli, right? <laughs> it's like, how can you eat that? Because it's got that disgusting flavor. But, but if, if valence was too much integrated into flavor perception, too bound with it, if it was bound with it entirely, then, okay, he wants me to hold it like this. If it was bound with it entirely, then you couldn't get that wonderful economy of flexible change that's, that's responsive to your physiological condition how much sugar have I had that's responsible to, to danger? Because when you know that you're in conditions of danger and stress, you're prepared to make more risky uh, maneuvers to try to, to, to get food. So, so the, you know, the, the, the hedonic reward will change. I mean, because your reward system is going to have to change and fluctuate to, to, to marry the conditions out there and the internal condition of the agent. You want a bit of flexibility, but you don't want your flavor perception to, to vary so much because 
Otherwise, you couldn't know if it was that food or you were con confusing it with a different food. Y here's the example uh, I like and, uh, and I've written about is I give you a piece of chocolate and you're very happy and I give you another piece of chocolate and you're very happy and I keep giving you chocolate. There'll come a moment when you say, no more chocolate. And I say, the experiment must continue. <laughs> Yale-like, you know, and I just keep giving you the chocolate. Now the hedonics for the chocolate have gone way down. The, the valence of the chocolate, you no longer like it. But if I suddenly gave you a different uh, make, a different kind of chocolate, you would notice it straight away. So you've got a baseline established for the identity of that flavor, even though the hedonics are varying. So I think you can, and in fact, it's probably an evolutionarily good thing to make sure that they can vary independently of one another. Barry, you, you define it cross-modality as when the input from one modality interferes with the processing of the input of another modality, yes. like a McGurk effect. Yes. My question is, when we have a, like a predictive coding that you talk about, and we have, for example, you see my arm that is, is going to hit the wood, and this is going to generate a prediction about a specific sound, yeah. wood sound. Yeah. Uh, this sound will be processed, taking into account this prediction. Uh, would you consider this as a cross-model interference or is it another kind of processing? That's a, that's a very nice question. So it may be that cross-modality is written right into uh, predictive coding or predictive processing. Uh, it, it's nice because just as the senses calibrate to one another, they, they don't have fixed relations. So if you're in an environment where uh, it's bright light, you're going to rely on the eyes. But if you're in an environment where it's very dark, your ears and the signals you get from sounds on the street will be more important. So, so, so you have a recalibration of these cross-modal effects, which, which things, what should I expect to find from hearing rather than what should I expect to hear from seeing, okay? And if you, as you said, if your, your arm is going to go down, you've got motor movements that are predicting how you're going to experience sounds. But um, some beautiful work by my colleague, um, Ophelia Darwah and her colleague from UCL, uh, Anna Tadura, they gave people sonic shoes. Now, what happens is when you walk, and I think we heard this in the talk, but I, my language wasn't good enough to tell, but when you walk and you're making sounds in the environment, that's telling you something, feedback, and maybe you can cancel out because you, you, know, you know how it sounds. But what they did was they, they made, they had sensors in the shoes that sent signals back to headphones and they can make the sound of your feet sound heavier. And when that happens, people change the way they walk. They walk in this very heavy way. And if you make the sounds lighter, less, higher frequency, people started walking very lightly. <laughs> so that's very nice because that's suggesting the same balancing of um, information, right? I, I'm expecting some sounds, I get an error message because the sounds are not. So, so, so you think, well, I, have to, I either have to change the whole calibration of how the body is related to the sound, or I'll tell myself here that it's the body that's heavier. So there, that's a cross-modal effect. But it's using something like uh, an error signal to do the recalibration. So I think they're probably quite connected with each other. It's a, it's a really good question, and I hadn't thought of it. Thank you. Uh, I have a question there about uh, uni, multi yeah. uh, perception, and uh, if I'm not wrong, you you don't have a, a final conclusion about that, or do you? 
about what what Spence are, and Brian. Oh yeah, are. I think they're wrong. I think they're completely. Ah, you are yeah. completely. Yeah, I mean that was. I was saying that it, it's a very strange view that says that our unisensory experiences are happening happening so quickly that you you they don't happen in consciousness, and yet what smoothly appears in consciousness seems to be the co-occurrence of at least two modalities, seeing and hearing. They also are arguing for their view by saying there's no synchronicity judgment, but I was giving the counterexample of dance and then saying we notice when synchronicity is broken, even if we are not able to very well judge when it's exactly happening at the same time. So, so I think they're wrong. But, but first of all, I don't think there are unisensory experiences. And they almost concede that. They concede that we don't have single unisensory experiences. So you have a unisensory experience, or you think you do, only because you're attending just to one of the modal aspects of the total experience. You're attending to just the smell, or just the sound, or just the sight. When you go into an art gallery, you think you're just using your eyes to look at the paintings. But of course, there is an impact of the acoustics in the room, the temperature in the room, the feeling of your body. And if we change those, we can make an impact on the, the very, often on the hedonics of the, the visual experience. So, so I think they're certainly usually multisensory. Many of those experiences are, that we think of as unisensory, are having some impact on them cross-modally by other senses. And then many of the things we thought were unisensory experiences, even when we concentrate on them, are in fact multisensory integrations. Yeah, that's the final view. A curiosity, uh, do you think that maybe our uh, self, engano, um, self, uh, um, engano, uh, it's, we, we are mistaken, it's, we are mistaken about our senses uh, because we s still think we are, uh, we have an unessential yeah. perception. So, yeah. do you think that comes from a kind of uh, folk psychology uh, vocabulary or about uh, maybe our attention to our uh, bo body parts in the sense that we have a nose, we have an yeah. ear, we have yeah. an yeah. eye, yeah. so that maybe the, the the perception of our own body um, creates this kind of mistakes uh, about ourselves. Yes, I mean, either either we are, a, either we think that our body parts are the causes of certain experiences. It's the nose that's causing this. It's the eyes that are causing this. And if we do think that way, where do we get that from? Is it something it's natural to think? Is it something we're taught to think? Children's books often say, we see with the eyes, we taste with the tongue. Is it cultural or is it, or is it biological? I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that. But we certainly, if we do think about body parts, we definitely think that we're tasting the flavors in our food from the tongue. And that's not true. That's absolutely not true. As we can tell, if you hold the nose and eat something, yeah. So, um, so we're making mistakes if we use the body parts. And some people might say, well, look, you still have experiences. That's right, but we don't just have experiences. We have a take, our take on our own experiences. or our. In other words, an experience is not a single undif undifferentiated thing. There's the experience, and very hot on the heels, there's this automatic classifying of it as of a kind. And we often don't notice that second part because it's so close to the experience itself that we don't notice it's part of the experience. And therefore, that's where we can make the mistake. So that's where we're mistaken about our experience. Of course, we have experiences and we know the experiences we have, but they're not 
they're not just like visual images on a screen. They come with this way we take our experiences to be. So, for example, the phrase, what it's like to smell or to taste a peach, what it's like, it's not, as many philosophers think, uh, the end of analysis. There's nothing underneath. This is unanalyzable. This is just an unanalyzable unit. I think the phrase, what it's like to taste a beach, beach, it's shorthand for what I take it to be like, which is my, it's not a very heavy reflection. It's a very immediate understanding, but it, it, it requires an extra step to classify that experience, and that's where we can go wrong, I think. Hi. Hi. Um, Professor Smith, thank you so much for your talk today. Uh, sure. My name is Priscilla, and uh, I have two questions. Um, first, um, what is, if any, the role of mindfulness meditation on uh, our perception, uh, specifically on how integrated or separate um, our experiences seem to be? Um, and uh, are these effects long-lasting uh, or not? And uh, my second question is related to um, how differently um, men and women may perceive things in terms of uh, how integrated or um, separate, again, uh, things seem uh, to them. So dangerous yeah. territory, both of those. Um, <laughs> okay. Thank uh, you. Thank you for the questions. So, so mindfulness. Well, mindfulness is a very popular idea and a very stressed idea, but there's an old word for it, and it's called attention, okay. right? And, and now it's mindful, it used to be attention. And, and of course, there's a really good question, which is, does paying attention to an experience change the experience, or does it just let you notice it? Does, it, does it change it? So here's the, here's the example. You could call it a mindfulness experiment. I want you now, I want you now to concentrate on the experience and the sensations you're having in your left foot. So think, all of you just think very hard about what's happening in your left foot. Now you can feel your left foot. Now the question was, was, was it always like that? And you just noticed when you attended or was your act of attending changing those sensations? That's a very difficult question to answer experimentally. We don't know. So, 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 so mindfulness may make a change to the experience or it might just let you experience it as it is without interference. We don't know. Um, but there are certain things about, and you asked about multisensory integration. A lot of multisensory integration is automatic, and you can't, you can't get into that by volition or attending or trying hard. You can't stop, and, and nor can you do that with lots of cross-modal effects either. So remember the example of if I give you some uh, liquid that's sweet but just below threshold, I give you vanilla just below threshold, and I give you them together, and now you smell sweet vanilla. That doesn't go away because you know that, that there's an effect of vanilla on sweetness. It, it stays. It's, it, the brain is doing this. We're, we're not having to decide to do it. So I think that's the first thing to say. Um, similarly with integrating taste and smell, you can't pull them apart by, by attention. There's no amount of attention that makes it seem this is the bit that's coming from the tongue, this is the bit that's coming from the nose. I did this experiment with people on Monday. So you, you have a nose clip or you just hold your nose and you eat a jelly bean. And if you have the nose clip on, you put the jelly bean in. All you get is sweetness, but you can't tell what flavor it is. And then you take you let go of the nose, and just a second or two, a couple of milliseconds later, in comes smell, and you say, ah, it's pineapple, ah, it's banana, ah, it's cherry. Once that's happened, 
you now know you weren't getting that flavor from the tongue alone, but once, once they combine, you can't stop believing you're tasting the, the banana with the tongue. You can't break them up, so mindfulness won't do. Um, men and women, oh boy. Um, okay. Uh, here's all I can say based on empirical evidence. On average, women have got a much better sense of smell than men, on average. So that doesn't mean every woman is better than every man. There will be men with exceptionally good senses of smell. There will be women with not such good senses. But on average, women have a better sense of smell than men, which means that they will often smell smells f sooner because their threshold is lower, or they will be able to smell uh, a range of smells that, that men just can't get. So that will make a difference to tasting food. It's bound to make a difference to tasting, and also to tasting wine. And um, one of the things we do when we're tasting wine, restaurants do this all the time, they, they pour the wine, they let you smell, right? And you're smelling to see if there's any fault. And sometimes the fault is due to a disease of the cork called TCA, and it makes the wine smell like wet cardboard. Now, we all have different thresholds, and I've got pretty low threshold, but all of the, the good women tasters that I know have got a threshold much lower than me. They can smell it in concentrations I can't. So if I'm ever in doubt and I think, well, I'm not sure, I will give it to one of my female colleagues and they say, oh yeah, absolutely, can't you tell? Okay, you can't. Um, but, but, uh, but there's something interesting about that example too, generally interesting, which is if I have to ask myself, is this, is this corked? Has this, got, has this got the disease? I can't smell it, but I, I, I'm, I'm asking, does it? I'm not sure. Then it does. So you should use your metacognitive awareness. The fact you're even asking the question means there was something that wasn't quite getting into consciousness, but it was registering, and if you're aware of that, you can take that and you can, you can do it. Um, yeah, so, so that's the only thing I'm prepared to say on record. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, thank you for coming. I, I have a question about uh, if we are uh, designed to, to unify this, the senses, because uh, if, if we are to, to uh, highlight one of them and relatively neutralize the others, we, we still uh, relate things as, well, when you smell something, you, you, you can't help but relate it to, to other things based on your memory. So I would like to, to if there, there's any uh, studies on if there's, there's uh, senses that we, we have in our memory uh, have the same effect on our brains, uh, on the activity of the brain, as uh, if we were actually like uh, 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 experiencing them, if what, what this triggering actually uh, uh, provokes the same effect. Uh. Yes, so um, smell is interesting here because smell has this strong connection with memory. There's a very strong connection with memory. Um, you mentioned the Proust phenomenon. So sometimes you'll smell a smell and it'll take you straight back to your grandmother's kitchen or to, to a place you were at school or to something, uh, a holiday you had. And it's amazing because you didn't know you had that memory until the smell evokes it. And then it, and it doesn't just seem that you remember, it seems very vivid, yes. almost like time travel. You feel as though you're there again. And yet, although smell has that powerful connection with memory, um, we're very bad at recalling uh, the names of smells. So if you're given, if you're given a smell uh, to smell, uh, and people often say, oh, what is that? Ah, I know that, what is it? Ah, oh, yes, it's familiar, but they can't name it. But I think part of the reason why they can't is because we learn odors with their sources. We learn them with the object in a multi-sensory way, which is with a shape, with a color. So, so when you smell orange, you learn that by holding an orange, by peeling it apart. 
by looking at it, feeling it, eating it. And, and instead, somebody in a laboratory gives you a little clear liquid, and you, your brain is supposed to say, ah, that's orange, when the memory for orange odor is probably stored with the look of an orange and the, the feel of an orange and the color of an orange. So it's very, very difficult to, to remember smells by themselves. And that's exactly what is so skillful about uh, perfumers and uh, wine tasters. They have to learn to, to take an odor source and think what it is. What's the, the source of this? When a lot of red wines all look the same, and yet you're being able to say, that's leather, that's blueberry, that's raspberry, that's, you know. So, so <clears throat> I, think, I think the relationship between smell and memory is complicated. But it's also interesting that m smell memory is often about uh, places where you had particularly good hedonic experiences. So all of you will remember having a fabulous meal, one of the best meals you had. And, and if it's me, you'll remember drinking a wine that was an outstanding wine. And I'll remember who was there. I'll remember the look of the restaurant. I'll remember the color of the walls. I'll remember the sounds. Now, why should I remember all of that from just a taste or a smell? Well, as animals, in evolutionary terms, if you were an animal and you discovered a really good food source, this is great, it was probably a good idea to lock in to memory what it looked like, what it sounded like, what, what everything else was around, so you could find that again. So I think this is probably why we have got a very good connection between uh, smell, memory, and place. And it's interesting that we, you know, Think of the places you go, your, your friends, homes, the university, and so on. You know how they smell. Think of, think of museums or galleries you visit that you like. You know how they smell. So you have a kind of place memory for the smells of places. And for elderly people, when, they when you get older, you lose your sense of smell quite rapidly in, from 70 years it diminishes before, but from 70, it goes down a lot. Those people often have a difficulty remembering locations and building new memories. And there may be a link between the loss of memory and the loss of smell. So I think there's a lot to do there, lots of work to do there. OK. Uh, so Warren Freeman asserts that uh, consciousness would not be possible without the appearance, without the uh, um, the novelty of the renoencephalon in the evolutionary path. And, and he says, uh, smell is, it's, it's highly important as an integrating, integrating sense. And it's highly important exactly for the, the, uh, the motives just, just uh, mentioned before. It's, it's very important for uh, Sexual selection is also important for adaptation to, to uh, uh, mapping out uh, food sources. Yeah. And he said that the, the, the whole picture, the, the, the advantages that smell give us, as well as selecting what is good to eat, what is rotten, or it's, I yeah. mean, uh, it's also important. He says, given all the picture, given the, inter the importance of integration of information and also the evolutionary um, advantages, he says, it's obviously the advent of smell that gives us the possibility of consciousness. It's a very strong assertion, but I think it's a very interesting one. The second question is, I'll, I'll try to rephrase her question in a more, um, uh, I'll say, uh, you said attention, it's, it's a world word for mindfulness, but there's a, uh, also uh, ancient word for attention called meditation. And what we see, when it, uh, the most important uh, row of alpha waves in our brain is to repress our visual uh, information. And whenever you, we are very, very visual, uh, we have a big visual cortex. So whenever you, we are producing um, a big amount of alpha waves, we we are able to repress uh, visual information in favor of uh, different modalities. So, 
it's very easy to, to design an experiment when you increase alpha waves by meditation to see how that influences the integration of, of different modalities by decreasing uh, visual perception as part of the, the cross-model perception. Uh, of course, that, that, as far as I know, that was never done. But, but I think she has a point uh, in the sense of it's in, depending on how we uh, direct and voluntarily, uh, allegedly voluntary our attention in some very developed forms of attention control as meditation, we could have, we could elicit some strange cross-model effects, I presume. Yes, there, there is a view, um, I think Charles Spence holds this and others, uh, Charles Spence and Ophelia Darwa have written about this, that you, they think you need, that attention's necessary for multisensory integration. I very much doubt that, but, but um, it, might be, it might be that you can induce effects by, by attention that eventually become automatic later, but you needed the attention in order to do the associative work to, to connect them. But um, think of intramodal binding. Think of binding color and shape or in the visual system. It's hardly likely that you need attention. But we do know you can disrupt it by giving people high cognitive load tasks which interfere. So the fact that attention can disrupt doesn't mean attention is necessary to have. So, yeah. But, but um, the point about consciousness and attention, very strong thesis, but, but I like it. Um, I like it because I think, I don't think it's, I think consciousness is the background, sorry, I think smell is the background to consciousness. I think it's always there in the background. Never the bridesmaid, always the bride. It's this sense that accompanies and does some supporting work, as you said, mate selection, recognition of danger, recognition of familiar environment, um, food and the pleasure of eating and choosing. It's, it's, it, and mood, and mood regulation. It's doing a lot, but it doesn't get, it doesn't get noticed for doing that. But I think it's always there. Um, some people think, some people like uh, Sobel, Noam Sobel, great olfactory scientist, thinks we're only conscious when we attend or sniff at things. But I'm with J.J. Gibson. I think um, we, we smell because we breathe. You can't stop. Olfaction's always at work. So I think it's a low level without much attention. And, and it's one of those senses that you attend to it when it changes. And it's maybe there to, 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 to notice change. So we don't smell our own home anymore. We don't smell our own apartment. It doesn't seem to have a smell. Strange, because everybody else's has got a smell. Yours doesn't have a smell because you've got so used, you've habituated, you don't pay attention. But if you go into your apartment and somebody's been smoking or somebody's been in there, you say, someone's been here or, or I've left the garbage out. So you have a baseline by which you're registering change. So maybe the sense of smell only comes to be noticed, captures your attention when, when it's change, when there's change which is a little bit like, you know, the visual scene is there, but the eye detects change, you know, that's really interested in that. So smell is too, but I think smell, you don't have to maintain a permanent olfactory scene with all the colors and lights that vision provides, but it is something which is working at a, at a low level of consciousness, I think. And, and when it's not there, when people lose their sense of smell, their consciousness is different. They say they feel behind glass, they don't have the same emotions, they feel very, uh, very different. They don't even feel comfortable in their own home. So it shows you, I think, that consciousness was really, it's either, it smells either in consciousness at a low level or constantly affecting, modulating how consciousness is. So I like, I like this thesis very much. Thank you. Okay, if there isn't 
another question. So we should finish this day. And I, I thank you, Barry Smith, for this excellent talk and also for all of you for the questions. And I see you tomorrow, okay, at half past one. Uma e meia amanhã nós recomeçamos os trabalhos no colóquio, tá? do colóquio. Eu espero todos vocês então amanhã, certo? Muito obrigada. Thank you very much.